Okay, let's do this. Recently, my good friend Jack Howard uploaded a rambly video about the state of creativity on YouTube and his place in the community, which reopened a huge can of worms. It's a discussion that clearly means a lot to a lot of different people, it matters a lot, and people want to talk about it. At first, I was happy to ignore it and go about my business as I usually do, but I found myself watching videos, having opinions, and wanting to get involved. So I've tried my best to make this my definitive video on the subject. From Jack's video, I head down the rabbit hole. I watched quite a few videos from different creators, big and small. I read a lot of comments and blog posts and took notes. Some of my opinions might be controversial, some of them are quite cynical, while others are quite hopeful, but I hope that all of it, um, can help somehow. So in Jack's video, Ramble About YouTube, he doesn't really manage to say anything. I love him, I love his work, we go back a long way, but in this video he kind of just says nothing for a few minutes. And I think it's because, like a lot of people, he's trying to be diplomatic and dance around the thing that he really wants to be saying. Which is that he personally doesn't like the cookie cutter stuff for tweens that is popular on YouTube nowadays. That's an opinion that a lot of people share, but looming over you at all times is the idea that if you express it, you may close a door that you might need to use one day. Jack is a professional personality, presenter, and filmmaker, and he wants to play nice. And he's not nearly Kanye famous enough to call people out publicly and have that somehow work in his favor. In the comments to this first video, Tom Rosenthal, whose stuff I love, gets it completely right. He says, and I quote, We are all at the mercy of the algorithm. The algorithm doesn't care about interesting or meaningful or original work. Where YouTube really fails and falls well short of Vimeo in this respect is that it doesn't help in directing viewers towards quality work from a wide range of big or small video makers, like the staff picks or other curation. So basically, there is much less in incentive for people to put genuine effort and care into their work, and a culture of clickbaiting mediocrity is born. It's harsh, but it's true. When the biggest numbers are the things that matter the most, you are opening the floodgates for everything to start looking kind of the same. From there, I went on to a response from Jamie Rogers, RE Ramble on YouTube. In it, she uses a term that I've started hearing everywhere, Little YouTube. Like if it was a place, like Little Italy, a commune of sorts for people under a certain threshold. Little YouTube, to me, describes a group of hobbyists who are using the platform as a social thing. She also talks about the fame transition, which is where we start running into issues. Fame is complicated. The problem with fame is that most people who pursue a career in the creative industries understand the value of it. For some people, fame may be the end, it may be the goal. But for almost anyone, it can be a means. Fame opens doors, helps you accomplish more, helps you earn more money. And for someone who wants to professionally create stuff that other people enjoy, it's kind of essential. She also talks about wanting better content, and that she's not the only one who feels this. That's true, but the sobering statistical reality is that you don't matter. When I lecture on the business of online video, I talk about something that I call the Ronaldo effect. A simple example is to look at how much your name or your channel is searched on a daily basis, or a more popular channel than yours. Look at how often in one day Alfie Days is searched on YouTube. Then compare it with the number of searches for a term like Ronaldo Best goals. Ronaldo is one of the most famous active footballers in the world, and the number of times he is searched for on YouTube is going to be this, while even the most popular professional YouTubers are going to be this. A pretty common theme throughout this discussion is that a phenomenon like that begins to train YouTube creators into doing a particular thing, often at the expense of what they find interesting or creative. From there, I watched another response video from Toria. She develops this exact point, talking about easy content on YouTube. Material that is made cheaply and quickly and is apparently not stimulating enough for a mature viewer. But let's look at our own habits. If we're looking for long-form, high-production narrative fiction, we go to Netflix or television. We very rarely find primetime viewing on a free platform because the economy doesn't support it. But the chances are, when we're on YouTube, we're browsing listlessly looking for something comfortable. I know personally that the times of day that I watch things that are shorter than 20 minutes are first thing in the morning when I'm still in bed, and at lunchtime while I'm eating. Give me something easy to digest, non-fiction, a podcast. Give me the latest episode of Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee, which is just people talking in cars. Give me Twin Joke by the Fratocrats, which 
for me is just watching my friends have fun on camera. Give me the news, give me source fed. Something that informs and entertains without challenging me and needing my full concentration. She also describes the phenomenon of vloggers taking a break and then coming back with renewed interest and motivation. Now this is where I might make myself a little unpopular. I think for a lot of people, this is a farce. Or at least the way that it is presented is disingenuous. I believe that for a lot of people, these peaks and troughs in activity are to do with the expectations we have of what we will get in return for our effort. It can be money, it can be numbers, it can be notoriety. A lot of people can't help but have expectations. And when we don't get it, we lose enthusiasm or we have to make compromises like getting more work to support ourselves. You have a strategy, it fails, or at least you perceive that it fails, you retreat. You consider a new strategy, you try again. But nobody's winning any marks with their audience by saying, the thing I was doing before wasn't really getting me the results, so I'm gonna try something new. Instead, you dress it up by saying, you're back, you've got all these ideas, you're motivated, you're gonna make loads of stuff. And we don't talk about what's really happening. That this is just the next step in your cycle of trial and error. Or worse, that you're a living cliche doing the same thing again and again, expecting different results. And the only reason I speak with any authority on the matter is because I've been guilty of it myself. From there, I went to Francesca Giorgiou. I hope I'm saying that right. She talks about little YouTube and she praises loads of creators that she loves. And that is when I unsubscribed from everyone I was following and started fresh with zero subscriptions. Then I watched a video from Marie. Generalization, she gets it. The idea that there is no creativity on YouTube is a gross, Generalization. We use generalizations like this to argue, but we need to realize that there is nuance everywhere. She asks two main questions. Why make things when not a lot of people are watching? And why are we still here if the platform doesn't care about us? She comes to the obvious conclusion, because it makes us happy, and it does. This makes me happy. Uploading things, seeing comments, getting feedback, making more stuff. That's a process that I enjoy. But there are three alternative answers I can come up with when I truly interrogate myself. The first is because it might change. Just like gambling or playing the stock market, your big win on YouTube might be right around the corner. And that's a mentality that if you wanna be really, really cynical about it, best benefits one party. YouTube. The second is because it serves other purposes. Like Toria getting work, I myself have got presenting jobs based on my work on YouTube. I also use YouTube to promote my music. If you've been watching me for the last few months, you will know that I have a new album coming out very soon and I'm very excited about it and I want you to buy it. And the third is because it's something we've done for a long time and we don't want to stop. There's a little bit of FOMO mixed in here, but also the idea that you've invested so much time and effort in something and you want it to keep benefiting you. As an aside, Marie also describes little YouTube with such affection that it sounds like a beautiful utopia I would very much like to visit. My accountant is calling me. I'll have to pick this up soon. I then watched a few more responses, including Matt's and Ruben's. I will link loads in the down. Again and again, I saw this recurring theme of little YouTube versus what is seen as unoriginal work. Then I watched Jazza's video, Is YouTube Content Shit? Yes! Yes, Jazza! Jazza argues, and I agree, that the idea that once upon a time YouTube was this beautiful democracy where merit was everything is a lie. He urges people not to see the most popular YouTube videos as representative of what YouTube is. Which I agree with, except for the ever-looming presence of the Ronaldo effect. Sure, it's not representative of everything, but it shows statistically what the majority of humans are consuming. Again, we search for generalizations because simplifying the world is the only way we can concisely talk about it. And what is popular is what you get when you file the sharp edges off YouTube. Then he, like so many others before him, says that we should stop debating all this minutia and start celebrating an untapped wealth of creators. That we should shout from the rooftops whenever we find someone whose work we enjoy, no matter how big or small their audience, and we should do so clearly and regularly. And that's when I resubscribe to Jazza. Then I watched Jacob Truman's YouTube Has Changed Jack Howard. Jacob is a very good friend of mine, I love the way that he thinks and I love the way that he expresses himself. And with typical lip in this video, he asks, why is anyone surprised? This whole debate is nothing new. 
People have felt like this for a long time. I'm one of them. And part of the reason that I don't spend all my time discussing it in public is because it's not entertaining. Also because a lot of the time it's a conversation for creators and professionals, not viewers. One where to find any answers we may have to reveal privileged information. It's a conversation that sometimes can only happen candidly behind closed doors. In some form or another, this has been a topic for discussion in every green room, backstage at every event, and in between takes on every web series for years. This conversation is an iceberg, and the videos that you see on YouTube are but the tip pointing out of the ocean. A lot of progress is made and insight gained when we talk about it publicly, but I would guess that a lot more change is affected in green rooms, and at pubs, and boardrooms, and offices. So then I circled back to Jack Howard's follow-up video, YouTube Discussion Continued. Jack actually makes a lot more sense this time around and touches on some interesting ideas. He discusses the idea of selling oneself, which is central to a lot of the behavior that we've been talking about. Then he immediately starts sounding really privileged by denouncing doing things for the fame. Let's not forget that the freedom to do exactly what you want is a privilege. Remember that fame can be a means to an end, and the difference between being savvy and being disingenuous is different for everyone, and at the best of times, blurred. So I made a really interesting discovery recently. I noticed that porn stars use Instagram and Snapchat and Twitter in very similar ways to YouTubers. The language that they use is almost identical. It's very easy to scroll through the Instagram profile of a porn star, find a selfie, and read a caption like, just shot a video, I'm so pumped, I might shoot another one right away. Or, just uploaded a new post, go check it out, I'll follow you back. Did you know that there are porn vloggers? That's a thing. I'm not gonna link to any of them, but you're on the internet, you have the tools. I've seen a video that opens, hi guys, how's it going? Been traveling a lot recently, I'm here in X doing some shoots. Just wanted to post a quick update to let you know what I'm working on, only instead of then signing off and saying like and subscribe, they lean forward and start fellating someone. And there's a really cynical and delicious joke to be made in here somewhere about them being the truest vloggers of all and giving the audience exactly what they want. So I guess when it comes to selling yourself, compare your work to that of a porn star and ask, are you offering anything more than they are? And how much does it matter to you that you do? The double-edged sword that YouTube is this democratic but not really, two-way but not really, interactive but not really platform means that issues get muddied. Ideas like the perception of fame and big versus little YouTube get conflated and confused. But the silver lining is that we do discuss it with anyone who is willing to listen. And hopefully that we can have a sense of humor about it, which probably accomplished more with satire than I have in this whole video. I hope this video has shed a light or many lights on and or around this issue that you may see at least some what in the visible spectrum and that I haven't alienated too many of you with my inside baseball. A close friend of mine recently described my attitude towards debates as chaotic neutral. I find all sides in an argument fascinating. I find the fact that people are so excited that they need to talk about something fascinating. I try to understand an issue without being driven by emotion or morals or ethics because that's how we learn. And just before I go, I wanted to shout out a video that wasn't mentioned in any of these notes because I hadn't yet watched it when I did all this prep. It's called YouTube is Dead. It's by a person called Lena who I'm lucky enough to know and have worked with. It's a poem and accompanying video and it is just deliciously satisfying. It again says as much as I've said here and far more concisely. So I will leave a link to that in the down as well as all the other videos that I've referenced. If you want to jump down the rabbit hole, you can, although in my opinion, your time would be better spent just making things.